you for coming tonight to our Food Talks event. I started the Food Talks series back in 2011 and ran it until 2018 and decided to take a break. Unfortunately, the break became a long break because of the pandemic. Unfortunately, a little longer than I had hoped, but anyway, we're back now. Very happy to have Tolache here as a sponsor tonight with giving us their room to be able to hold this Food Talks event. I want to thank Rodrigo here. He owns the restaurant and uh, you just tried some of his food and you've got some drinks here. I just want to introduce Rodrigo for a minute. You can just talk about his restaurant and whatever else he is doing. He also owns Mizell on Main Street and 12th Avenue as well. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm really excited to have everybody here tonight. Uh, thank you to Richard for, just for making this happen. And, uh, you know, it's always been a pleasure to be part of your events. So, yeah, this is a new venture we started uh, three, four months ago. Uh, really excited to have all this group of chefs coming up to, uh, here tonight uh, to share, you know, all their experience and uh, talk to us and share their time with us. And uh, yeah, just just excited to showcase a little bit of what we do uh, and just to, to share the space with everybody. So welcome. Let's uh, have a good time. And uh, really excited to be here. We have six amazing speakers tonight. I have known all of these chefs for a very long time. I'm very happy to have this panel together. We're gonna to see everyone's quite different, but I think the message goes that there's also a similarity there because there are chefs of different backgrounds, they're running different, different kinds of restaurants, they're doing pop-ups, they're doing all sorts of things all over our food community. So I'm very happy to present everyone tonight. So the first speaker is Chef Will Lu. Chef Will is running the Versante Hotel. He's executive chef there of all the restaurants inside this hotel, banquets and catering and everything. There's a lot going on there, but I think he's a, he's a good multitasker. He's been doing this in many other restaurants around. He also works with Ocean Wise, he works the Chinese Restaurant Awards. So please give a warm welcome to Chef Will Lu. Starting off, I think, with the theme that we want to talk about, and that is, it's a jungle there. I think the best way to sort of put it for myself is to sort of tell the history and the story behind how we all became chefs in our own way. So, a uh, brief history for me. My grandfather was a chef back in the 50s in Chinatown. I think they're opening the restaurant that he was running. It was called Ho-Ho's. And uh, they're gonna open that again real soon, from what I know. And so, until I even did anything like the Chinese restaurant, was I didn't even know that connection was existing for myself and for my family. So uh, that's one big thing is like food, this culture that we have really builds together how to connect the community. So with that being said, here's a brief history. Um, I always thought I was gonna be a chef. My grandfather, I would cook with him every day, every weekend. Everyone else was playing Lego and watching TV. All I would do is uh, be in the kitchen. Is he adding sugar? Is he adding spices? Is he adding something? How do you cook this thing? Because the only question I ask, how do you make this? And then, and then after dinner, we'd always uh, paint and draw and do any kind of woodwork things. So wherever I got my artistry, I, I mean, we're all artists here. We all communicate differently, but at least for myself, how I became an artist, it was through him. And so as life went on, I was a musician. I went to, I played violin my whole life, and with that. It led me to do many, many things, such as playing orchestras and playing musicals and doing my own shows. So that allowed me to also see another side of food, which was based on performance and on a stage and being able to showcase uh, a concept, an idea that is your own, but in your own, in a way that can galvanize a community. Just like right now, like we're all here for a purpose. We're all here to support each other. We're all here to support Richard. We're all here to enjoy the food. So I think that's a huge aspect of it. Um, I didn't take the typical route. Uh, you know, I think me and Mark, you were, we worked together back in the global days, he's right there, right? Like, he always likes to laugh at me, even back when we started a long time ago. But uh, I walked around Yale Town not even knowing what a chef was called back about 23 years ago now, or however, yeah, roughly around there. And then I, I remember going to a few restaurants and just asking for a kitchen job. And they're like, oh, you want to talk to the kitchen manager? And so I'm like, I guess the chef is called the kitchen manager. So uh, I went around everywhere. I went to some really famous places at the time and still is today. And I embarrassed myself greatly. And I kept asking for the kitchen manager and everyone just made me wait in, 
in the lobby for like half an hour and say, oh, sorry, the kitchen manager's not here today. Come back tomorrow. Uh, and then I went to another restaurant where I asked for the same thing. This imposing, huge, scary guy with like one wonky eye came out and said like, I'm the executive chef, what do you want? I'm like, oh, uh, I just want to help in the kitchen. And he looked at me, I was wearing a suit. I played, I was playing musicals at the time. I was like playing in like Theater Under the Stars as a violinist. And then I had no idea what the industry was about. And so uh, blindly, uh, I, I'm like, I'll, I'll do anything. And he's like, when can you start? And I said, I'm gonna start right now. And then he's like, okay, follow me to the kitchen. And I had the one suit I would wear playing music that I earned playing music. He, he brought me in, I was so excited. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna touch food, I'm gonna make food, all these things. And then he threw me into the dish bin. And then, uh, and yeah, I, I didn't care. That was my first real job other than music. And so I thought, thought to myself, this is the best. And then and that day, I ruined my suit. I finished at 4 a.m. in the morning, but but that day also, I feel like the culinary life, like a lot of us, flashed before my eyes and allowed me to sort of see what direction I want to go within the career of being a communicator through food, communicator through art, communicator through music, whatever that platform may be. Um, so I just worked my way up. I went to university, I did an animal biology degree. Uh, while doing that, I played music and washed dishes every day. Right? So that was really cool. They didn't let me touch food until two years later, so I washed dishes for two years. But from there, I just worked my way up. Never went to culinary school. I still think it's super important, but just everyone's journey is different. And that's what I think is really important here today is like, it's the diversity of how we become who we want to become. Uh, and with that being said, one major thing, there's a few major moments, at least, again, jungle out there. We'll, we'll talk about the jungle because I think the jungle is how we navigate this urban world ourselves or this professional world, and that's the jungle that we live in. Um, so that being said, one major thing at university was wasn't the biology classes, but it was like art history. And the art history professor would only ask one question all the time. And that was, what is the significance of this piece? And ever since I gravitated, gravitated towards that, everything that we sort of do within the realm of communicating through the canvas of food that we have here is uh, making significance. It doesn't have to be major significance or it could be the biggest significance ever. But having that ability to share with our community, share with, um, a younger generation, an older generation, any generation, any any diverse culture or anything like that. It was, it, it's, it's, it's making a voice for ourselves to help others find their voice. And if that's through food, that's something that I really appreciate doing. And I think a lot of us do that. Um, the other major aspect was obviously understanding what, is, what a stage is, right? Like even navigating like a musical theater stage, that's gonna be crazy because that, that's a jungle too. Everyone wants, the, everyone wants the microphone, everyone wants to be able to have a voice, and everyone wants to be able to find some way to showcase who they are, but still within being accepted within the community. And so seeing how the singers and dancers and, and, and actors, how they sort of lived their life and how they were so boisterous, but at the same time so inclusive within a nerdy violinist stuck in the, dish, uh, stuck in the orchestra pit, um, it definitely opened up, opened up my eyes at how I would want to sort of portray the world of food. And, and ultimately, with all those things combined, working, way up, working our, our way up to become a chef, um, one major thing, and, and Will's here from OceanWise, one major thing that changed my life forever in this jungle was learning about and, and perpetuating seafood sustainability. So combining the ability to share ideas through food, combining a background of animal biology and marine biology, but also combining uh, the maybe music or fine arts. It was something really important for me to recognize that not just making the most beautiful food, but making the most significant and meaningful food possible. And, and that's been a mission that I think we've all been sort of navigating throughout this time within this jungle uh, and, and try to find our way to sort of preserve this jungle just as much as it is a jungle there. It's just as much something that we want to have preserved. So it's all our own journeys to sort of get out and, and find our voice, but moments like this, like having an audience that is so passionate and so diverse, uh, you know, Richard allowing us to have this moment in time is, is I think what it's all about, is, is allowing us to have the voice that we can share once we have our mission in life. So, um, if I'm forgetting anything, let me know. If not, you know, like, I appreciate every other panel speaker here. Like, we're all so diverse, we're all like, 
we come from different places, but we always have the same philosophy and the same sort of passion to, to make something meaningful. So hopefully we, today and forever forward, we're gonna make that meaning even stronger. Thank you. How do you say it? Cooking wasn't my, always my passion. I didn't start cooking until I was 28. So I'm kind of late in the game. But I don't think age really defines sh what you should and should not do. You should just follow your heart, right? You can be like 60 and still go bungee jumping, you know, assuming you're not gonna die out of a heart attack. You should just be able to do anything that you want. Age doesn't matter. Um, but I really love eating growing up. Um, I mean, I've not, never really been this skinny. I was kind of, kind of chubby. I like call it baby fat, but no, it was like food baby. Um, I cooked, <laughs> grandma, my grandma cooked all her life. And um, she would make me my favorite meal every Sunday. Sunday, we don't do anything other than going to grandma's house. We eat from lunch till dinner and then pack all the leftovers and eat it for like the entire week and then go back again on Sunday. And I just miss her so much. She died really young, but you know, without her, I wouldn't know what love is, what real um, home cooking is supposed to be, right? There's also all these recipes out there. Chefs are like, I eat like this, I eat like that, but it all comes from reason because you gotta taste what you think is good, right? I can follow all the recipes that I want, more salt, more sugar, but it's not going to be yours until you think that it is what it's supposed to be. And um, I was an investor banker for six years. I uh, went to NYU in New York, got my degree in investment banking. Loved it, yeah, making six figures when I was 21. Holla, you know, going to like Bird of Goodman, you know, Neiman Marcus, Prada, Gucci, no problem. But that was not fulfilling, and I always feel like there was a missing part of my soul. So then I was like, hey, you know what? Let me just go to cooking school, try it out. The worst that could happen is I learn how to cook and I marry a rich guy and I'll just be a housewife, whatever, fine. But, you know, but when I went, and the first day I just remember I have to julian and carrot. I'm an investment banker. I move money, okay? I'm talking about millions of dollars of money. And I could not even, can I curse? Freaking cut a carrot. I'm like, what is going on? Like, you know, like one million dollars transfer, no problem. But I just could not Julian this carrot to save my life. I was like, no, I gotta do this. And the more I try it, the more I remember how my grandma would just tell me, just cook with your soul, cook with your feelings. So what, you don't have a perfect cut. Does it taste good? That's all it matters. And so, so on and so forth. After I graduated from cooking school, I got my bonus in January. That's when they pay bonus in banks, okay? That's when they actually go out and spend money, just so you know. Um, then I just started working in a restaurant. I, before that, every day after work, I would just go stodge at different restaurants. Um, I didn't care if I had to peel a case of carrots or you know, uh, peel a, a case of a, clean a case of parsley because I know you have to start from the bottom. You have to learn the basic before you go to the top. Without a foundation, everything that you do up there is gonna crumble because there's nothing down there to support you, to have to give you a good foundation. And afterwards, I worked at a really nice um, New York Times three-star restaurant um, in Midtown. I remember one day, one of the meat cook was like, I'm moving to Italy. I found the love of my life. I'm like, all right, good luck with that. And then he just left. And then that meat cook um, position just opened up. So I told my chef, I was like, I can do it. Let me do it. He would say, how? I was like, I've been watching him. I've been watching him, how he seasoned his meat, the timing, everything. I know I've never done it. Give me a chance. I promise you I can do it. He's like, sure, Des, here you go. Do it. Three months later, homeboy came back. Sorry, love didn't work out. And then he came back and I took his job. And he wants his job back. I was like, no, bro, it's mine. <laughs> No, it's mine. No, sorry, man. And he was like, he was like, what? You know what? You can never be like 
me. I'm like, no, I don't want to be like you because I'm better than you. <laughs> so all I want to say is how to maneuver through this jungle, right? Going to a Costco is a jungle. Going to an Asian market, trying to fight with the Asian grandma with a cantaloupe or a watermelon, that's a jungle. But if you believe in yourself, all right, it will come to you. I don't start till later. But look at me right now, 47, I know I'm fabulous, I look young. It's just that, even when I went on Top Chef Canada, I didn't think I could do it. Like everybody else at least 10 years younger than me. Meanwhile, my phones are cracking. I'm like, I can barely get up in the morning. And then th those guys are like pumping irons in the morning, you know? I'm like, oh my God. But my experience, my will, and that the belief in myself that I can do this got me to well, number two, it's okay. You know what? There's another fellow number two right there, but you know what? We're doing really well right now, right, Mark? Yeah. All I gotta say is like, it's what you make out of your life, okay? Somebody can give you the path, but if you know, you don't know how to walk it, you're just gonna end up going the other way direction and nothing's gonna come out of it. So if you can, you know, sit in front of your computer or PlayStation, a new PlayStation and go through the hardest part of uh, obstacle and be like, I can beat this level, I can beat this level. If you have that tenacity, if you have that determination, apply that in your life. Because life is like a game too. There's lots of obstacles, there's lots of stuff. And it's all how you want to perceive your life. So, you know, just do it. Thank you. So the next chef, is someone I have known, I think it's probably one of the first chefs I ever met when I started my food blog back in 2009. Uh, and you were working at, I don't remember the name of the restaurant, because there's been so many restaurants since. Uh, but Chef Mark Singson is right now the king of pop-up dinners around Vancouver. Uh, if you've seen a pop-up dinner, he has something to do with most of them. Uh, but a lot of things have done. He's gone from restaurants to pop-ups to doing collabs with fried chicken sandwiches all over the city, because I'm seeing a lot of that right now, and you seem to have a hand in a lot of them. So I want to welcome Chef Mark Singson. He's also had, been on Top Chef, and uh, welcome to the jungle. Thank you. Hey, my name is Mark Singson, and I'm currently a private chef. Uh, so I guess we're here to talk about a little bit of what the industry is like and uh, the jungle. Um, we'll start with a little bit about myself. Um, I became a chef because I love to eat. Uh, that's something that I love to do. And um, my mom was also a chef, and she was she's my biggest inspiration for this day. Uh, yeah, and um, I don't know. Yeah, okay. uh, and she just passed 2019, right? Just for, right before COVID. So it's still a little bit fresh. Um, so I truly, deeply miss Mother B. Um, but uh, I'm still pushing now. Uh, so those are one of those moments in my life where it was a big turning point. Um, damn, why did I start with that topic? That's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so I started in the, in the restaurant world. Uh, I've, been, I've been in it for like more than 16 years. And I feel like it's still, every day feels like day one. Um, every day I feel like there's always something new to learn um, and what I've noticed in my career that you get what you put in um, I think that's in anything with art um, so the company that I've been since I left the restaurant world it's uh, food art music Inc so the pop-ups I've been hosting are called Faming and now we've started the new series called Mabuhai YBR which translates to long live uh, I'm Filipino so the word comes uh, as Tagalog and it means long live and I call it Mabuhai YBR because I'm born in the Philippines, but raised in Vancouver. So for me, it's the same a Buhai YBR and saying long live Vancouver. So most of my food and my inspo and dishes are from Vancouver and the places I've traveled. Um, so one of the restaurants I was in, I guess not recently, six years ago, uh, Annalena in Kitsilano. Uh, so I helped open that. Uh, I came back from overseas. Um, so when we're talking about the jungle, you know, the industry for me has changed a lot through the years. Um, where I come from, it's more, uh, a little bit of, 
people say it's negative. It's negative now because in context, back in the days, it was kind of acceptable. Of course, it was never really acceptable, but for me, I was okay with it because I am what I am today from those experiences, so we, you can't take that away. Um, so when I came from overseas and helped open Annalena, I've been in, um, there was something I needed to do because that was a restaurant that I truly loved and I love being in the industry, but I needed a break. So when I left was a moment of, in my career that I knew I needed a little bit of change and I kind of needed to see it from the outside. Uh, just because I've been cooking for such a long time since I was 16 and my mom had a restaurant when I was in high school. So cooking was always something a part of me. She went to culinary school. She's the one who told me not to go to culinary school. Um, just because, you know, she was just like, cooking is so hands-on. Um, and you get what you put in, and then you come in situations where you're actually getting paid to learn. I know most cooks are, we don't get, we don't, we don't get paid a lot if we're coming up in this industry. But it's one of those moments where if you're actually super passionate about this, you could get paid and learn. It might not be the best, but if you love the game, that's all part of it. Um, so now I do pop-ups, private dinners. Um, so that has a lot of different uh, <laughs> ups and downs as well. So as a private chef, I cook in people's houses from like, sometimes they'll hire me for a week or a month two months, three months, uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner. It sounds really awesome when you get to travel, but breakfast, lunch, dinner, it's, it's not as fun as it sounds, um, especially when there's lots of requests. So from my experience, all those are all positive, right? Those really make me who I am today. Um, you know, but now I'm in the middle of like, with these pop-ups where I get to try out new ways of being a leader, new ways of um, teaching, uh, just different ways where, just because I came from that environment doesn't necessarily mean that I should be passing that down to say, I'm okay with it, I love being in the ship. That's like for me, as a chef, if you're not swimming, you're not getting any better. If you're not like in the deep end, you're not getting any better. So it's always about just, I feel like, it's always what you put in. Um, I think it's in any art form, right? So with my pop-ups, I've been doing a lot of trial and error. Um, trying out uh, different styles and when we do these pop-ups they're pretty like on the go you make the menu on the day of but there's a little bit of menu like maybe planning the week before um, but what I've learned from that is my approach with teaching them has been extremely beneficial since I've changed my the ways I've been you know passing down my knowledge or giving them moments to be confident where they can feel like they're making a big difference in the team. Um, I put them in situations where they're gonna succeed even though they think I'm putting them in the shit. It's like, I'm very aware that they can do it, but they just need a little bit of a push. So when I think about the jungle, I just wish the things that I want my staff to go through is the support that I wish I had coming up in the industry. So I always try to look at that as like the ground zero where I'm like, fuck, I could do that better. You know, I could show that better. I should let them actually make mistakes because that's what made me what I am today. All those mistakes, I am where I am today because of all those mistakes. Um, and I'm always down for the trial and error. You know, I think cooking is all about that. And I think when we take that you know, aspect when we're teaching the crew, teaching the staff, you just gotta be more patient. Um, so those are the things I've learned through the jungle in this industry where I had to make the change because the industry was also evolving. There's one thing that I feel like the food constantly evolves all the time. You see new dishes, you see new combinations of flavors, new chefs working on plating, but I felt like the environment in the kitchen just didn't evolve, right? Everything, the food constantly evolved all the time, but the food took, or the industry, the inside, the environment in the kitchen is so behind on changing that. So with these pop-ups, I've been able to really work on things I've always wanted to work on, um, you know, being a better leader, being a better chef, because I know one day I'm gonna open a restaurant, you know. The biggest thing I could say for people in the industry now is just don't be afraid to make mistakes, right? I tell that to my cooks um, all the time, because I was in a situation where I worked in fear. I, I like messed some things up, and either the chef yells at you, or slightly, really, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 
you know. <laughs> um, we, we worked together ages ago, and there's a few people that we worked under where it was like, it was so old school that looking back, it's definitely not acceptable. Um, so now I'm in this position where I'm able to make that change. And um, so how I survived through the jungle is making the changes and adapting to the situations. And, um, and just treating the people in, on my team the way how I wish I was treated when I was coming up into the restaurant world. And um, anyways, I'm gonna keep it pretty simple, pretty short there. Thanks. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Mark. Uh, so moving on here, uh, Chef Warren Chow, I met him about, I don't know how many years ago it was, at Jupiter in Chinatown. I think it was Jupiter, right? Uh, so uh, fast track to a couple years ago, Michelin guy comes to Vancouver, finally. So everybody's so excited they came here and recognized so many restaurants. And um, this year they added a new award, and it's called the Young Chef of the Year. And Warren Chow was recognized as Young Chef of the Year for Vancouver for 2023. So, he, is, he is the executive chef of Wildlife Kitchen and Bar out at UBC. Let's welcome Chef Warren Chow. So yeah, firstly I want to thank Breaker for hosting and Claude for, for having us this evening. And also thank you to all of you for joining us on this lovely Monday evening. Um, yeah, a little bit about myself and how my career started. Um, I always knew I wanted to cook, uh, ever since I was five years old or so. Uh, just watching chefs on the Food Network, uh, being able to throw things and dishes together, so effortlessly, having so much knowledge in their repertoire. Uh, at, you know, at their fingertips, seemingly, uh, was so magical to me. So ever since I got the chance to step foot in a professional kitchen at 14, uh, I started washing dishes and just started learning uh, from cooks and chefs above me and really coming in early or staying late and uh, really absorbing everything I could. Um, so kind of worked my way up, and I did my apprenticeship at the Pear Tree Restaurant uh, under Chef Scott Yeager. And as you know, Scott, um, working in his kitchen, that can prepare you for any jungle uh, that, that life is gonna throw your way. Uh, that was probably the toughest kitchen I've ever been in, uh, but I learned a lot about myself and what I needed to do to prepare myself for a sustainable and long-lasting career for myself. Um, yeah, so that, that kitchen that kitchen built my foundation. As, as Chef Dez said, um, if you don't have a strong foundation, uh, no matter what you learn afterwards, uh, it's, it's gonna crumble, it's gonna come, come back and bite me. So really securing myself in that, in, with that foundation was a, was a really great jumping off point for me, for my career. Then I moved on to hotels, uh, golf clubs, um, then I went to Kelowna, and then I was at Mission Hill for a couple of years at CDP. And then I returned back to Vancouver, and then I, I landed my first executive chef position at 25 at, at Juniper. Uh, when I started that role, I kind of got thrown into it because the executive chef at the time uh, gave us notice. I was there for all of two months in my new sous chef position, very excited, so much to learn, never placed an order in my life, and still kind of learning all that. So uh, when, this, when the executive chef gave his notice, uh, I got thrown right into it. People ask me how the learning curve was uh, stepping into a role like that. I tell them it's not a curve, it was, a, it was like a right angle, and uh, here you go. But, when you kind of get into a position um, when failure is not an option, you push yourself hard. Uh, humans are very adaptable and resilient, and especially chefs. Chefs, I feel like they're not only good cooks, but they're plumbers, they're accountants, they are HR. Um, they, you wear a lot of hats. When, when you become a chef, that they don't teach you in culinary school. So, kind of being in this jungle, I would say, 
Uh, you just you just kind of take it as it comes. You take it as it comes, and you know when you stick to your roots of, of adapting and learning and uh, really molding yourself to the situation and making the situation work for you instead of fighting it, then I think I think that's kind of the key to to riding riding the wave and, and, and really really um, kind of moving forward with this industry. So. Um, after that, uh, at Juniper, um, Juniper closed down at the end of 2019, and then I was set to take over Bauhaus as their executive chef uh, in Gaston. And I was there for all of three weeks, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, and then we were forced to close down that restaurant as well. I know I have a pretty bad track record of closing restaurants, but uh, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that was just the situation. So. Um, yeah, the, the pandemic hit and then everybody, you know, had to find ways to adapt and um, pivot. And that's when I found, found myself in private dining for a couple of years. So I was a private chef for about three years at Vancouver Private Dining. And that in itself taught me a lot as well. Um, still being a chef, still cooking, still being creative, but in a completely different element environment um, as, as Mark would know go into people's homes. You don't know if their oven works or not. You don't know if they have plates. You don't know if they have the appropriate cutlery or, I forbid, you forget something at the commissary kitchen. Uh, we've been there. Um, so, so you learn to adapt. You learn to, you learn to really, really roll with the punches. Um, and then uh, after, after three years, uh, I left, I left uh, private dining and then I uh, had the great opportunity approached by the Jim Patterson group to open their first uh, full service sit-down restaurant, which is Wildlife Kitchen and Bar. Uh, we opened that in, earlier this year in February. Yeah, we opened February, so we're about nine months old now. And boy, it's been a nine months. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, and opening a restaurant. That was my first restaurant opening, and, and you know, I learned a lot uh, about opening a restaurant. Um, everything that doesn't have to do with cooking, really. What uh, what what music subscription are we using uh, for the restaurant? You know what kind of what kind of saucers did we order for our, our espresso cups? Do the espresso cups fit on the saucers that, that we bought 250 of? Um, you know all these things that, that, that you learn as a chef that doesn't have to do that directly with cooking. I think um, ultimately makes you more prepared for things that. Um, you can control. So things you can control, you can control. Things you can't control, don't really stress out about. It all works out in the end. Um, and then for for adapting and, and kind of being a jungle out there, I think I, I feel like growing up in this industry, um, a lot of us in this room, we as straps, as cooks that we're coming up we were trained a lot differently than what's acceptable now to treat your cooks and treat your staff or the way you talk to them. Um, so that, that in itself is a whole learning curve and adjustment um, and with inflation, uh, the, the talent pool that, that we're currently facing, the labor shortages in our industry where everybody decided during the, during the pandemic that, hey, I don't want to be making minimum wage or less than minimum wage working 12, 13, 14 hour days in kitchens anymore. So really finding ways around that and retaining staff and keeping your menu prices uh, competitive so you're still making money but you're not gouging. Um, working with suppliers Closing, staying loyal, building those connections and relationships uh, is, is kind of how you navigate this jungle. Um, and then I would say, like, for success and to kind of keep your career sustainable, um, just keep your head down and work hard. Keep your head down and work hard. Don't don't chase anything. Uh, things will come. Things will come, and, and you know, keep your head down, work hard, and. and people will notice uh, with my recent uh, Michelin Young Chef um, recognition. I didn't see this coming at all. It was a huge surprise to me 
Um, but I'm completely honored to receive this award. Uh, Michelin, the Michelin Guide for us here at for Canada and Vancouver has always been this far-fetched accolade that you know you would think you'd have to go to overseas or go to Asia or somewhere to work in a Michelin star restaurant. And that not being the case anymore um, really secures us as a destination dining city, which is amazing. It shines a spotlight on a bunch of us chefs and restaurants and people who work so hard day in and day out and uh, to be funny, recognized as, as a top destination dining city in, in the world, I think it's uh, something very special. So um, to be recognized for this award is, is, is a dream come true, and, and I'm very excited and happy to kind of pave the way for uh, the next generation of that. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chef Warren. So, uh, Chef Ravina, I've known for quite a long time. She's actually, I run food challenges all over the city for doing this now for 12 years, and her bakery has been in several of them. Uh, she owns two bakeries out in Surrey, Cloverdale, called Just Cakes, started as a pastry chef. And if you don't, if you don't know that, you will hear a bit more about her in a minute. Um, and she's a judge on Wall the Bakers for uh, Food Network as well. So please join me in welcoming Chef Ravina. Um, thank you so much to Richard to, for inviting me, and it's been incredible hearing everyone else kind of share their journey. Um, so, a little bit of backstory about me. So, I started, I'm a baker, I'm a pastry, baker turned pastry chef. So, um, as a little girl, when I was 16 in high school, I got bullied a lot as a kid. So, I was awkward, I was shy, very insecure, and baking and the kitchen is where I really truly found myself. Um, I remember every single day coming home from school, 3.30 on the dot, I would make my grandma some chai, chai and I would bake something. Banana bread, cookies, being on YouTube for three, four hours a day, just obsessing over cake cloth and food network and just, just dreaming of this life. And slowly but surely in my final years of high school, I was really able to take that, you know, what once was a struggle and make it kind of my superpower. Um, and by the end of high school, you know, people at school kind of started to call me, you know, the school's cake boss. I would make the periodic table of elements in cake form, or the phospholipid bilayer in biology, biology 12 in cake form, or in Spanish class, there was an amusement park city that I made in cake form. And it's, it's so crazy to look back at that now, and it's just, and when I was given, when given the topic of the jungle out there, it was, it kind of brought back all those memories in terms of consistency and tenacity. And I know a couple of those students have touched on that. And that's kind of the theme that I find I find myself reflecting on, on a lot in my dream. So after high school, went to UBC, lived in the dorms. And if anyone has lived in dorms before, you don't you don't get a kitchen. You get a common area. You get cafeteria food. <laughs> um, yeah, you you don't really get a kitchen. And that was the year that I really really truly realized how important the kitchen. Growing up, I, got, I was so lucky that you know my family appreciates food so much. Um, always cooking new dishes. My background, I'm, I'm, I'm South Asian, so uh, beyond that, beyond South Asian dishes and, and things like that, my immigrant parents really, really assimilated and really embraced so many different cultures and cuisines growing up, and I, I feel really lucky to have had that growing up. Um, but going forward, that second year of, oh, sorry, that first year of university is when I realized how much I loved the kitchen, how much I needed it for my mental sanity. So in my second year of university, I moved off of campus. I lived in a very small apartment. The kitchen was literally like that end of the table. That was a small retro oven, uh, but it was an oven nonetheless, a little bit of counter space. And the first thing I unpacked that apartment was my KitchenAid mixer, really, and I still use it, I still have it, I use it all the time. Um, a KitchenAid mixer and um, my a, a cake pan. So I made my cousin a baby shower cake, and it was so good, it was lemon raspberry, I still remember. And I brought it over to the baby shower, and I remember thinking to myself, I can do this, I can actually have my therapy back. And that was such a liberating moment for me. Um, and just it, it helped that it was another further step of increasing my confidence in the kitchen and just realizing I had that I had that for myself again. Um, and 
going forward from year two to year four, I true as a full-time student, I was literally running kind of like a full-time business at the end of it uh, on weekends making wedding cakes from this tiny, tiny kitchen. Um, and it was, I felt like the luckiest girl in the world. And that is kind of that journey of building this business from the ground up. Um, I would literally make business cards on paint. Does anyone remember paint? I would print out like a hundred of them at a time. I would go during the exam season to the library, the 24 seven library, and go to every single table and drop off a cupcake and a business card. Say, hey, book me for your next event. I know we're all students and we can't afford it, but book me for your next event. So I became, again, quickly known uh, around campus as the girl with the cupcakes in Irving, so go see her. Um, but yeah, so going forward that year two, year three, year four, not only was I kind of laying the building blocks for, for my business, but also just allowing myself to be, you know, confident in my skills and allowing myself to see myself in a role that I never thought was possible. Again, going back to being South Asian and coming from a culture that is in the diaspora here in North America, we're still very much growing up with an immigrant kind of mentality with our parents. And that's not to blame them, that's just um, acknowledging the circumstances in which they came to this country. And they didn't get the same opportunities that their kids do. And now that you know we're able to kind of carry forward and really practice with those opportunities, it meant so much more than just me doing something creative. It meant that it, it meant breaking barriers, it meant going something to do something out of the box to hopefully one day allow for representation in this field. Um, I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me growing up on Food Network. I never saw a lot of people that looked like me that owned bakeries. And for me to be able to be supported in that by my friends and family at such a young age, I think is a huge, huge reason of why we've been able to see, you know, the journey of Just Cakes uh, as it is today. So that tenacity, that support, that consistency, I think is a huge theme of, you know, it's a jungle out there. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll be touching on that a little bit more. But after kind of, you know, having that university experience and laying those building blocks, um, I made the, the bold decision at 21, uh, leaving everything and flying to Paris and doing, uh, doing a school out there, pastry school out there. So I attended Belloway Conte in Paris. And for four months, I got to train under some amazing, amazing chefs. Again, it was something that was really out of my comfort zone. I'm, I, I may not realize this, but I'm very introverted and very nervous about like, being up here. I'm very like, I never thought that I could do something so bold, go to a country that I didn't speak the language, I just literally picked up and left. But the fact that I did that was also another just lesson for me and a sign for me that, yeah, I wanted that, wanted it so bad. And that also relates back to that consistency um, so going out there and that really invigorated my love for baking and pastry and it really just reignited the reason why I started. Um, when I returned in August of 2016, I remember making a promise to myself that night that I would open up open up a bakery, I would open up Just Cakes um, in a year from now and I was able to do so in 11 months. And in that 11 months time is where I really realized the jungle that is this industry. Um, my background was not in food, it was not in a restaurant, I didn't grow up, you know, around that kind of environment. So being, you know, setting forth this um, goal of opening up a bakery, I just didn't realize what was ahead of me. So, um, and also being, you know, a woman trying to um, build something, people didn't take me seriously. And also my age kind of had a, had a huge factor in that. So in that 11 months, Contractors didn't take me seriously. The day, I remember the week that we opened up, more people came into the bakery saying how fast I was gonna fail versus congratulating me. So I, I look back on those moments and I'm so proud of myself that I didn't let that deter me, even though it was really hard in the moment to kind of take those words and say, I, I worked so hard for this and I thought it would be different. But again, it's that one step, one step every single day. And I think that's kind of the big lesson here is every single day, if you just take one step for, forward, 1% every single day, as cliche as that is, you can get so, so far. We often underestimate what we can achieve in 
you know, in a year's time. And I think that's pretty incredible and it's a testament to, you know, the, our willpower and our, our own superpowers when we tap into our passion and, and what we love and actually allowing ourselves to really feel that passion. I think that's a huge, huge part of that as well. Um, so now, you know, after that first opening, you know, you, you had your first year, and we're, we're really like, at, at that point, we were, you know, gaining traction on social media, and then that first year, that really helped us. And second year is where I was like, okay, now I need to learn how to be an actual business owner. And I'm like, this is not what I do, I, I just make cakes. So kind of being thrown into that entrepreneurship and leadership realm was a whole nother ball game that I never anticipated. Um, but then again, it's that how bad, like I know a few people mentioned it today, how bad do you want it? How, you know, what you what you put in is what you're gonna get out of it. And it's just that constant commitment to your craft. I think that is so huge. Um, so after, since we opened, that second year was brutal, <laughs> like brutal. That's when I really realized, okay, costing is a thing. I can't just be giving out for cakes. That's not a thing. Um, and you know, leadership and, and dealing with staff and hearing their concerns and trying to be an ethical employer. That's been a huge topic as of late as well, you know, trying to uh, change the, the status quo of, of the food industry and how can we make it better and, and what do we keep and what do we evolve with? Um, I think that's been a huge thing too. And it's going from there, you know, trying to in my third year, then you know, having a little bit of a idea of how to how to manage everything, and then in the third year, COVID hit, and as a company at that time, 80% of our revenue came from wedding cakes, and there was no weddings to be had, and no birthdays, and no large events, so uh, we took a huge, huge hit. And I remember that two weeks that we had to shut down and kind of rethink. I, I literally could not get out of bed. You know, I don't, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I had to lay off all my employees, and I'm like. I, you know, I had a team of, I think, 10 or 11 people at that time, and, you know, taking food off of their table, and like that, that destroyed me. And, you know, I, I know it was mentioned um, earlier too, you can't, you just, failure is not an option. And when you have your why so, so ingrained in you, and, and your people are your why, it, you can, you can really perform miracles, and you can really tap into your own magic and, and superpowers. So what we did then is, so we have this one product it's called our cake in a jar. I'm not sure if you guys have seen it, but it's where it's cake and icing and filling in a jar. So we were doing quite a few of those. I started those in 2015. Um, but, and, and they were a popular product for us, but they weren't what they are today. So, and COVID is the reason that they are what they are today. Um, we literally pivoted, uh, everyone loves using that word in the pandemic, but we pivoted and we created North America's first cake in a jar vending machine. And that helped catapult so much more than I could ever expect. And again, that relates back to, yes, it's a jungle out there, but it's about tenacity, adapting, filling the holes where you can, and then tomorrow there's gonna be new holes, and then you're gonna fill those ones up, and you keep going forward day by day, right? Um, and now we're expected to expand to, you know, 10 plus machines of, across, the, across the province next year. and. It's, it keeps going and keeps going, and we never thought it could get to the point where it could, um, which is super exciting, but again, it just relates back to one step at a time. Um, so yeah, that was year three, year four, um, and now year five and six is you know managing the after effects of COVID. COVID actually helped our business quite a bit in just changing things up, changing our offering, and and kind of reeling things in, and now we're in this other kind of phase of expansion and scaling, and that's a whole another set of problems. And it's there. There are days, you know, as of late, that I, I don't know how we're gonna get to the next week and make payroll and pay this vendor and that vendor. But at some point, we just figure it out. And I think that has just merit to the tenacity of just chefs and the and the food industry in general. We figure it out. And I think that's really beautiful about the industry that there's this kind of grit about us and I think it's so special that I, I don't really see it in a lot of other industries the way you see it in the food industry. So we're fueled by passion. We're in this industry because we love food and we love connecting with people. So I think tapping into that I think is so huge for us and today is a testament to that too. So yeah, but that's kind of what I have to say. talking about
restaurants, chef from restaurants. We've kind of kind of gone down the journey there. The cake jar, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I, I was hoping you'd bring that up. The cake jar machine. And now we take a little turn. So our last speaker tonight is Chef Tushar. Uh, we met when he was at, uh, he was a restaurant chef at Mumbai Local on Davies Street and working in the restaurant. And then things changed and pandemic, I think, did this. And uh, now he runs uh, a whole bunch of things which he'll talk about. Uh, he has a food truck out at a brewery out at Fort Moody. They're also doing packaged food, packaged Indian food, um, and that's available all over the place. And uh, he, um, uh, he has the jars and all. So he's gone, he's gone the restaurant side of things into packaged food products, and I think that brings in a whole different world of part of this jungle. That is something that that's a whole different world. I mean, I don't know how you can do that every day. But uh, I wanted to, uh, and, he, and he's also doing pop-ups and he's doing things all over the world. I think he just did some stuff in Vietnam, he's doing things all over the place. Um, all sorts of dinners and wherever he can cook with all the chef friends that he knows in other countries is really exciting to see. So please join me in welcoming Chef Tushar. Joining. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, my name is Tushar, and uh, I'm born and raised in India, Mumbai. And I was always surrounded in the kitchen with my grandmother, mother, uh, and I always wanted to be a chef, but I didn't know that uh, my parents would let me pursue what I want to do. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I wanted to get study culinary but I uh, I was very afraid of asking my parents because in India parents pay for your tuition fees. You know? You uh, and you don't work until you get graduated. You work after the graduation and I was a very poor student and that's why I started cooking. And if I if I have to read anything I would just fall asleep. You know? <laughs> So that's why kitchen, like chef, chefs has a really good talent of the practical talent. You see something in the kitchen and you can replicate it. And that, that's the beauty of becoming a chef. And I, um, I took an admission in BCom and not in culinary school just because I thought my dad wouldn't allow me to do it. And uh, I wasn't happy and my best friend at that time was studying culinary and his first bakery practical I remember he he uh, came home with a uh, freshly baked bread and he shared with me and I was like shit this is what I want to do and I always just was surrounded in the kitchen so I go home and I just I start crying and ask my dad like hey I want to become a chef I want to go to culinary school and uh, he was like uh, you know and I come from a very middle class family and, the fees back then was also that a lot in Mumbai. So uh, my dad still like believes in me and uh, tell my sister like, hey, like I think he really want to become a chef. Like go to the college and talk to the principal. Like the course has already started. It's been a week. Like uh, if he would lose a year, that would be great. So my sister goes with me to the culinary school and uh, luckily I got admission in that year. And, that's how the whole journey started. And after the culinary school, I went to U.S. for training. And uh, I love the culture. It is the food culture in India is not that great. We work like 15, 17 hours for $200 a month. And we just sometimes sleep in the hotels, in the bunk beds, and go back and do the events and just be there sometimes for weeks. And I always uh, was like, and my sister was also working in the hotels, but in HR, and my sister was like, I don't think you want to work here. You're not going to make any money and we're not going to see you anyways. So might as well just go abroad. So I, uh, I started researching on like some courses in Canada and New Zealand and in the US. So I thought Canada would be a best option. And I like the culture already. Because being in the US, it was almost the same. So I moved to Niagara Falls, started uh, uh, enrolled in post-graduation program. After moving from Niagara, after graduation, I moved to BC because uh, the immigration that time was really easy. And uh, the, my first priority was 
to find a job in the kitchen and just apply for PR. And uh, I think I did the best decision ever. Like basically, we were just so fortunate enough to have amazing produce here, amazing weather, like better than Niagara Falls. It's just, like in winter, like it's dead. You don't want to be there. It's so cold, and coming from Mumbai, like in hot weather and growing up in uh, growing up there, it was I hated my life. Yeah. So, uh, but DC was like I loved it here when I moved here, and uh, I was fortunate enough to work uh, with some really amazing chefs in uh, Fish Island Center Park, to do water, to Bauhaus, and uh, starting my culinary career pretty much from from the bottom. And uh, after working in all these restaurants, I realized that there's something uh, missing here and I wanted to work in Indian restaurant and I have never worked in Indian kitchen and this is something uh, I want to pursue and I started applying for all the Indian restaurants abroad which uh, all the chefs I would used to follow and uh, I randomly I just slide into a DM on Instagram at, at Chef, Res, uh, Chef Kagan in Bangkok and uh, I didn't even know that he would reply because he was like, his restaurant is like number one in the world that time for like three years in a row. But he replied and I was like, I was in the gym and it's like, as soon as he replied, I just sent him my resume. And the next thing I, as soon as uh, I sent him the resume, he's like, okay, when you wanna come and uh, I packed everything here is like and just moved to Bangkok to study to, to work under him and after working for three months in his restaurant I realized there's so much in our culture in our food like in India like I should just start doing more about Indian food and every region in India is totally different from people to how uh, the, the culture the costume the food chain is every kilometer and that's what I learned when I was working in Gagan. And after my internship, I was just like inspired by what he was doing and showcasing India on the world culinary map, pretty much. And after I moved back to Vancouver, I was like, now I want to just do Indian food, but I don't have any knowledge about Indian food, like how it's done from the scratch. I've seen my mom cook, cooking Indian food. I've seen my grandmother cooking Indian food, so then I started to uh, travel more in my country. Whenever I would visit to India, I would just work, I would just go to the street vendors where I would go every time to eat food. And I would just go with a book and a pen, and they would be like, what, why is this guy here with a book and a pen? And just like standing there for three, four hours. It, I was just like observing them and just like starting you know, taking notes of what they're doing. And, uh, because that's like inspiring for me, what they do in India. I mean, because every kilometer the food changes, the language changes. And, so, uh, and I was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to uh, open up Mumbai Local on day. And my friend was opening and he was like, hey, I'm doing something related to Mumbai and the food which you know, we get here in Indian restaurant, I didn't even grow up eating that. And, any food that we get here except for dosa, we didn't grow up eating butter chicken or naan. You know? like, my Sunday meal would be totally different than what we get here. Even day to day meal would be totally different. Like four days a week I would I grew up eating vegetarian you know? because because my parents were very religious and for religious purposes. Like there were some days just like we believe in God and like we do non vegetarian food and we just eat vegetarian during this time. So uh, when I got the opportunity to work at Mumbai Local, I, the only thing I was like, I need to, I wanted to showcase the food I grew up eating and what uh, makes me happy and not what uh, people, you know, like what everyone knows here in Indian food scene. And that's where it started and then I started training myself in cooking Indian food. And uh, but things didn't go well with, uh, with Mumbai Local. And I had to move on and I I quit and I was like what I'm gonna do now is like let's be a private chef but do more like Indian tasting menus and uh, I used to chef uh, I used to follow Chef Mark Singh and he was like doing a lot of private type dinners that time and uh, you know learn from uh, learn from 
watching him. I didn't know him back then, but uh, I used to watch him what he used to do and the pop up and stuff. But strictly, I wanted to do is like this Indian, but regional Indian, and the food which I grew up eating and what inspires me. And uh, I launched I launched him in pantry. You remember like in at the best time ever a month before COVID. And uh, I just in few months I realized it was the worst time. But honestly, it was the best time for me because I learned so much and uh, I was. That was the best survival time for me, like to be in the jungle, right? Like I, uh, I launched as a private dining company for next three months. I lost all the clients which I had already booked, but I had to do something to survive. So I started doing meat I started doing retail products, started grinding my spices, and started selling the spices like ready to eat products from frozen meals to jars to uh, I tried every single thing. And uh, I was fortunate enough that it, it helped me to uh, to sustain. I sustained. I sustained until everything lifted and uh, started doing the private dining again. Right? But uh, moving into retail side, it's a totally different world. It's completely different world because it's nearly impossible to come be head to head with the corporate. So I'm still like uh, I'm still finding ways to be honest to uh, how to sustain and expand it Canada wide if I have to. But uh, I think I'm really happy <laughs> being where I am in retail side. So just be local and be uh, in the local market and be at the be at the premium market. But uh, one thing I always had in mind, which and I think that helps me in uh, being in this jungle, is be different from others and be do things which needs to you with the cook food which is meaningful and cook food which is which is inspiring and tell a story about it as well because like I think I'm very fortunate enough to be born and raised in India and uh, because every street vendor there have a unique story behind him and every street vendors from the vendors to the restaurant, everything is completely different. You know? And every state has a different cuisine. When I go to India, that's like it's inspired me so much that and when I come back, it helped me in pushing and the boundaries and go above and beyond and show what India is about. And it's not about just butter chicken and naan and just you know few dishes, which is very popular in the restaurant and. You know, you, you don't eat, you don't eat that. You, like when you go to India, it will open up your eye in like in such a unique way. Like in you, you try food in India, you wouldn't eat food in India. In India yeah. So I think that's what helped me in uh, in pushing the boundaries and be inspired. If growing up in Mumbai and travel across India. And I was also very fortunate enough to work in work with so many talented chefs who have now been abroad and like doing their own thing. Like uh, Richard just mentioned, I was in Vietnam, and it was uh, so luckily I it happened to be like my uh, mentor and chef who helped who hired me and helped me to get even a proven resident in Canada as a restaurant in in uh, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And when he saw I was in India, he like. You need to come here and do a pop up, and, and I, I was like, okay, let's go. And I just like went to Vietnam and did a pop up with him. And even there, I did regional Indian food and food which you don't even get in Vietnam. And everyone, everyone enjoyed it, and that's what keeps me motivated when people when I do something which is unique and meaningful for me, and they enjoy it at the same time. Thank you. So my first question is, what if there was no pandemic, how would each of you have continued on your business from 2020 to now if there was no pandemic? Can anybody do that? Oh, oh, yeah, we got a lot. You can all ask. Who wants to start?
Okay, um, Richard's question was, uh, what if there was no pandemic in 2020? Uh, how my career would have shaped up to be? I think I would still be in the position I'm in, um, in restaurants. I'm a restaurant guy, I think, through and through. Um, it would have just maybe taken a beeline to, to where I am instead of having to pivot into private dining and then going back into restaurants. I think I would have just continued my path um, running a restaurant. So I think that that's kind of where my career path would have been. I think I would become a raging alcoholic. No. <laughs> I, I would have stayed at where I was, um, like uh, Richard was saying earlier, he and I met at Old Bird on Main. That was, I was the opening chef there, and I was doing really well with this new concept of Taiwanese cuisine, meet Hong Kong, meet, you know, world. And um, we were going on like doing really well and then pandemic to kind of shut us down and that took me a turn. But I think without the pandemic, I would probably, again, become a raging alcoholic and still work in restaurants, yes. <laughs> um, although the pandemic was super, probably terrible for everybody, uh, clearly we all saw a silver lining throughout it all. And then at least for me, the silver lining was to, number one, find a mission that I really cared about uh, to perpetuate even when restaurants were shut down. So people like Chef Warren, uh, almost everybody, they helped uh, myself put together a fundraiser to save the Vancouver Aquarium at the time. It went, especially it was on the verge of being shut down. But that also led me to get a dream job of mine, which was to work for a non-profit organization, which was OceanWise, which allowed me to be the chef of OceanWise at one point. And, and with biology, with science and everything else that was my background, it allowed me to to, to sort of go through, uh, to achieve a dream that I never thought could be achievable. So that is my pandemic story. Um, I guess for me, if the pandemic never happened, um, there was a moment in my career, there was a lot of opportunities coming along the way. Um, and I wasn't in the mood to be, I wasn't in the situation where it was like, uh, everyone's advice after the show was to strike when, when, it, when you're hot. Uh, but for me, I didn't want to strike until I was composed. You know, there was a lot of opportunities. And, um, and then the year before COVID, I was actually in the middle of opening something and it kind of fell through with a partner from Montreal just last second. And um, that was kind of a blessing in disguise. You know, I was three years deep into business, uh, catering, private chefing out of the restaurant world. And I was really itching to get back, but I just knew it didn't feel right deep inside, my, my gut feeling, I always have to trust that. Um, so for me, COVID, the second year was kind of a blessing. I worked for some really good people in the second year. The first year was difficult because, you know, I had to figure out how to make some income. I couldn't go to people's houses, uh, but, oh, should I say something? No. Uh, <laughs> you know, but it was like, if you, my clients kept me afloat, you know, I dropped off food privately in the back and, uh, or their place was big enough where no one's actually in the kitchen so I can set up their whole fridge with tons of food prep and they never have to leave their place. Um, so I sort of, you know, kept with one family. Um, so yeah, I would be in, I feel like if it never happened, I would be in a position where I, maybe I would have opened that restaurant and, um, you know, there was that moment where I had to completely change my style of cooking because who I was partnering with um, so, again, I, I feel like I'd kind of be in the same position, <laughs> but um, just not maybe the position that I look back now that maybe I don't want to be in, because now I feel like as opportunities come, I feel more composed and I feel like I really truly know who I am at this point. And um, so I'm excited for that opportunity when it comes, so yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, for me, it was definitely, if COVID didn't happen, I don't think our main product, our cake in a jar, would be as big as it is now. We wouldn't have had that silver lining of doing the vending machines, scaling. Um, we're in 85 locations across BC and Alberta right now. I would not have had that opportunity if it wasn't for COVID. Um, because if it wasn't for COVID, I, wasn't, I wouldn't be focusing on that type of scaling and that type of retail. So I'm actually really grateful. For that and it taught me a whole different skill set 
Um, so I think I probably would have eventually got there, but I think COVID fast track happened. If COVID didn't happen, I would have been in LA and opened up a restaurant. I was about to move there in uh, Jan and it was all set up, but uh, I'm honestly glad that I didn't go because I wouldn't have done anything what I have done so far. The retail to the food truck, to the Indian pantry and the expansions and all of that and lots of prior and error and uh, run run the business straight from the scratch like from the ground just myself i wouldn't have done that so yeah so anybody have questions please raise your hand Golfing, <laughs> four hours of uninterrupted smacking a ball, stress relief, outdoors, fresh air, and beer. Kickboxing for me. Yeah, I'm also a part-time kickboxing instructor. So people pay for me to yell at them. It's, a, it's amazing. Uh, maybe mine's more altruistic, but like, when it comes down to finding ways to help support each other in the community, doing any kind of volunteer work that we can. Aren't um, you <laughs> <laughs> but it's true because we all do it here together too. So they're just not mentioning it. We're all doing it. Um, but that's, that for me, you, you, utilizing our craft to perpetuate something that we can do for others, that's what's going to help me. Um, I'm a loner at heart, so I, I love spending time alone. I go for dinner alone, watch a movie at the bar, put my headphones in. Uh, just because like, I'm so used to working with people when you're making breakfast, lunch, dinner. So when I'm, for me, it's just alone time. Alone time is really important. Um, that's probably, probably why I'm also single, because I'm like, mm, alone time is great. <laughs> I don't want anything else than this. It's awesome. Um, you know, so yeah, for me, alone time. Um, even the bike rides, listen to a podcast or a book and just kind of explore the city that I love. You know, Vancouver's fucking awesome. So, uh, yeah, alone time and some weed. <laughs> um, for me, I'm more on the business side of things now, so I don't get a lot of time in the kitchen. So the kitchen very much for me is still my sanctuary. So I kick everybody out. I have a huge piping bag full of ganache over my shoulder and I'm baking something and I'm just squeezing it into my mouth. That's my, that's my happy place. So yeah, chocolate. For me, uh, spending time with my close friends and my partner just uh, makes me feel good in, uh, when I'm really down. Also being in the nature, being like, Vancouver is such an amazing city. 30 minutes you drive anywhere, you're in amazing wilderness and just go for a walk and just, just fresh in your mind. Uh, Local, they're he's in fashion. Um, they've recently absorbed a um, a man's clothing line, Raining Champ. So he, I cook from the second year of COVID because I wasn't sure if I was gonna have um, what the third year was gonna be like. I don't normally take contracts for that long, one month, two month max, maybe three. But I end up working for this um, CEO of a company for for nine months total. Um, he's in the um, women's fashion line. And uh, there are other people I've cooked for outside of Vancouver. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because I have to sign an NDA for some of these things. I don't know if I should yeah. be, yeah. But would you consider going outside the country for outside? I, I have, yeah. There was a time in my, um, like right after when 
co like COVID was done, I went to Hawaii for three months or for two months for for work. Um, so he's that guy's in the music industry. Um, so again, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then um, there's some local ones. Um, but I do have clients from overseas, but they just have some houses in, in, in Whistler or somewhere in Vancouver, and um, I don't know if they're they're not really celebrities or just people that. No, some select. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, word of mouth. I don't do. I don't really do a lot of marketing except for my dumb social media account, where it's like you know, it's like a double-edged sword. Like, love doing it, but also it's a lot of work. But also, it seems like now it's such a gray area where to be authentic, it's a little bit more difficult, but also it's still easy. But it's everyone's got these opinions about social media and it's hard to be yourself sometimes and um, so I feel like with that it's a double edge one but, uh, I feel like I went out of topic but <laughs> but uh, yeah so there's some big names I've cooked for but uh, yeah again one of them is local and he's in the women's fashion um, um, industry yeah and anybody else with questions please raise your hand please. so you guys all talk about how you were inspired by Food Network and what you saw on TV you probably didn't see anybody who looked like yourselves so how does that shape what you do and how do you, so it's not good enough these days to be a your chef, to be good at what you do. You have to have some sort of authenticity, something extra that you have to be out there for. So anyways, how did that shape you guys? You go first, let's go. Um, my why ever since I started was um, a lot surrounding around other young, especially South Asian females and giving them just one example of what can happen when you truly, truly do believe in yourself. And representation matters so much. I can tell you countless times where I've been in the parking lot of Costco and a mom or a dad comes up to me and says, you are the reason my, my daughter is pursuing X, Y, and or son or, or anything like that. And I, just to hear that and to be a small part of that representation matters so much. It makes all of those hard times so much more worth it. So. Um, I guess for me, when what was the question, please? Yeah. Uh, personally, this is 20 plus years ago. I didn't have a sous chef or a chef that was Asian uh, or any form of Asian. Um, but and also, in at that time, I only saw myself as that minority there. No longer anymore. Like almost everyone that I get to work with now is so diverse. But at the time, um, there was no one to sort of show you how to be the version of you that you think you're supposed to be. And so it just takes, it just takes one mentor to sort of help you figure out who your identity is. And so example for myself, being the only Asian cook at the time uh, in any of that organization that I can remember that was in anything of management or whatever, uh, anything along that line, uh, one person sort of took you under their wing and gave you that opportunity. So by finding that one opportunity, for me, it was uh, talking to tables, right? I was, I was my first day as a my first day as a cook. Um, that chef, there was like a center table, you know, there was a coast, the original coast, and there's a center table. And the first, uh, my very first chef wearing a chef uniform, not a dishwasher uniform. Uh, he asked me to make 16 desserts. And, and then I made them all, I thought they were beautiful at the time. And then he's like, oh, help me bring it outside. Talk, uh, give it to the guest. I, I did that. And then he stopped me just before I was about to leave. And he said, now explain it to, explain what you made to the crowd as the executive pastry chef, which I was on day one. And, uh, and then I froze, I had no way, no ability to communicate what I made, even though I knew exactly what I put on the plate. And so all I said was, I made you chocolate. And then I ran away, right? Um, but then after that, every single day, he made me talk to every table who ordered a dessert. If they didn't order dessert, he made them order dessert so I can talk to them. And, and it wasn't about like what I was making, but it was about creating an identity for ourselves or as an individual being of this heritage or not, and, and allowing us to sort of gain our own voice. So like, that's what's so beautiful about this industry. Uh, I, I believe, I think like it sets you up and it makes you grow up so fast, but it sets you up for every other aspect of life that you may not be exposed to. And you get to learn so much about yourself where you didn't know you needed to be something that you could be. 
Well, as you can see, I'm not the typical submissive Asian girl out there, all right? Um, I actually didn't really experience the whole uh, you're Asian, you're female chef um, in New York, really. It's just that, can you cook? Or you suck, that's it, right? You, or in, you're out. Um, it's actually really in Vancouver that I felt a little bit more um, defined in the way I look or anything. Um, I just remember I went for a job interview last year for, I'm not gonna say the chef's name because I will get myself into trouble. Um, he knows who I am. I was just getting a sous chef job. I wasn't even asking for CDC, even though I know I'm well capable of. The first thing he said to me was, I don't know if I can hire you as my sous chef because all my other male sous chef might quit because I'm a woman. And I said, um, I'm pretty sure I got bigger balls than all your feet, all your male chefs combined. But the fact that you said that to me, you can it's a hard man. I don't care who you are, all right? I don't care it is, I'm about to drop his name. Do not do that. I was like, I never felt that in my life. But that gave me a bigger motivation to be better. I'm a chef, doesn't matter anything else. That's what I want to say, like, if you believe in yourself, because nobody's going to believe for you. Nobody's going to believe in you except you believe in yourself. And I know, without these balls, I still cook better than anybody else. So yes, Asian or not, female or not, you can cook, you're good at your job, and that's all that matters. Follow that. <laughs> Yes, yeah, chef. Um, yeah, I mean, for myself, uh, growing up, like you said, watching the Food Network, uh, there wasn't really a prominent Chinese chef or a, or, a, or a chef celebrity. Maybe Martin Yan, but he was still Ming Tai, Ming Tai, representing you know mostly mostly Asian cuisine. Um, but for myself, growing up. In grown up, uh, sorry, born and raised here in Vancouver, I didn't really feel that much racism growing up. Um, obviously, there were stereotypes here and there, and you just brush them off. Uh, you know, kind of play along, and you know, you want to fit in, and, and you want to, you know, you don't want to be the outcast, and you know, oh, that's not funny, right? So you, you just kind of let it really slide off your shoulders, or you know, ducks off the waters, or water off a duck's back. Um, but it wasn't until I moved to Kelowna where, you know, in my early 20s, when I actually felt that racism uh, almost day in and day out, whether it be through my peers, my fellow coworkers, my sous chefs, my chefs, or just going out and dining at a restaurant. And that was a good eye opener for myself, um, where I realized racism still does exist in, in this, day and age. <clears throat> um, but for myself, I just always focused on what I could control. You know, I'm, I'm here to cook, I'm here to learn, I'm here to build myself up, and, and I think that just took over everything else, and you know, everything else just fell by the wayside. Just, you know, block out the distractions. Um, and through working on yourself and, and, and learning and growing, uh, you, you just become stronger and more, more confident in your own, um, own skill set, and and you don't you don't stress the little things anymore. No. Uh, for me, it's uh, it's very important when I create any any menu or dishes to uh, tell the story of the different regions of India, but at the same time use uh, local produce from here in the season and support the uh, you know, the local farmers and local vendors. And But at the same time, it's important to uh, not take away from the cuisine. The taste has to be very authentic, but using local ingredients.
trying to dodge it. You know? um, I guess for me, you know, growing up watching the Food Network, um, there's a few people like Morimoto, Martin Yan. I think Martin Yan's local. Is Martin, is, no? Never mind. So, anyways, um, but I guess I've always watched them. Yes, no? Martin Yan's gotta be local. That's Walker. Hey, one, two, three, chop, one, two, three, chop. <laughs> it's not, that's what he said. <laughs> and then uh, Mormoto. You know, there was something about Mormoto that, that for me, that I really can relate to. He was so confident when he says Neo-Japanese. And I've always thought about, you know, the food that I'm trying to do with Filipino food or even just with myself, it's always something new. Um, but with the whole racism stuff, that should always exist, man. That, that's never going to go away. Let's be, you know, it'll be always be there. Just the approach to it is going to be a little bit different from what it was before. But um, I kind of just learned how to brush it off and uh, focus on yourself and and really just focus on your craft. And um, again, like Warren was saying, you know, just the things that you're, you have in control, and that's kind of what you can focus on. But uh, I, don't know, I feel like I butchered this question. So, cheers. <laughs> Like a dish that's like a like a Canadian dish that's like inspired by like well, where we. Well, you consider Canadian because. Okay, um, I, I guess think, I do that. I think in any culture, there's no authentic like, right from, from the ground like corn or whatever. Right. From so your influence, what would you? Um, it's even so, for me now, even working on Filipino dishes, I think for Filipino cuisine to grow, you have to actually break it apart, and then that's a lot with a lot of cuisines that's coming up. You know, we our food has always been out there but it's never been really taken out of context. For things to actually grow, we must actually break it. You look at Chinese American cuisine, you look at Italian American, we never actually really cared about the history until it was part of our culture, right? Like, I think Filipino food should be the same. So when I think of a dish where, you know, I do one of them now, it's a perfect example of, I'm born, born in the Philippines, but raised in, in Vancouver. I do a tuna, tuna tartare maki roll with like garlic fried rice. And I torch it because that's very Vancouver with the mayonnaise. And I put Montreal steak spice in it. And I serve it with nori. It's so good. <laughs> and for me, that Montreal steak spice was something in our pantry growing up. So I would put that on everything. My mom's leftover food, a little bit of Montreal steak spice. So that's why I feel like, for me, that's Filipino food to me. Right? And to the context of it's the flavor or the idea of context come from Filipino because it's like, the burnt onion jam that I put in it, which is a Filipino dish called bistec, which is like a dressing out of uh, burnt onions. And then putting it in the maki roll, again, very Vancouver, and the torching the mayo. We all love torch mayo. So, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like that would be in, in that direction. And um, again, for, for me right now, what I'm trying to figure out is how do I break it even further, just so we can come back and revisit what the history is. Um, but for it to evolve, we have to, we have to break it and, um, Make it familiar to everybody, and then we can come back to it and revisit. I guess, but I don't know. Something like um, As I'm a baker, um, and my background is in South Asian Indian cuisine or Indian food, um, yeah. So a lot of Indian desserts are stickingly sweet, coated in sugar syrup, and it just, it just tastes like sugar. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they're delicious. No knocking on it. Um, so I think what I do really well with Just Cakes is a fusion of really traditional Indian desserts, but making it a little bit more um, kind of just North, like North American, I think is better to, you know, and infusing Indian flavors like cardamom, pistachio, rose, gulab jamun, but in a cheesecake or in a layer cake. Um, you know, my most popular flavors are cardamom dream, the cardamom pistachio cake with a milk chocolate cinnamon ganache center, a chai glaze, and um, a Swiss meringue buttercream. So it's like a combination of all these kind of things that play to what you know, I, I grew up with, um, but also uh, still honors you know, a really traditional dessert on both, on both fronts. Yeah. 
Uh, personally, I think for your question, and also the way I like to cook in general, is uh, sure, quintessentially we're all Canadian here, and quintessentially we have so many cultures that meld into each other and we learn from each other, we're inspired by each other. But if I was to make something Canadian, I would take the terroir or the maroir that exists in BC and across Canada and just do something about nature and, and, and utilize what's local, utilize what is indigenous to here, utilize what's sustainable to here and, and turn that into some, um, some piece, some, some piece of art that can inspire the fact that we come from this gorgeous, spectacular country and especially with the nature that's surrounding us. That's what I would make, theoretically. A tidal pool, right? Right. A tidal pool, uh, the mountains, like these are dishes we've done, I've done before, but um, it's something that is representative of what is nature here, is rep representative of what is hopefully sustainable, also, but also what is so, um, unique about what we call our home. So what is, what that would be? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make you the ocean and you're gonna enjoy the ocean. Yeah, your title is really good. Yeah. Come visit me. <laughs> um, well, I would really like to be able to bridge between what is Canadian Chinese, egg rolls, I don't know, like Panda Express, eh, or to like really authentic stuff that you can get in Richmond, but you know, it's intimidating go to, go, to go to a Chinese restaurant if you don't speak the language and wait, the wait, I mean, the servers will look at you and you'll be like, uh, and you'll be like, uh, oh, I don't know, okay, give me this point at the picture. Like, I want to be able to bridge between, um, just don't get so intimidated, right? Um, be able to let, like, a lot of times when I go out to dim sum with my friends, I'm like the token Asian. Like, I have to order in Chinese and they will be like, but I won't order beyond, like I wouldn't order chicken feet, I wouldn't order tripe, but they'd be like, ah, no. But there's, like, I mean, there's selected amount of non-Asians would be able to eat that, but most of them wouldn't. So I want to be able to educate, to let people know that there's like, um, beyond uh, what Asian food should be. And in Canada, it's such a big melting pot. You, whatever you want, you have it. I had the best um, Vietnamese food here, like not even in New York, like here in Vancouver, I have had my best bowl of curry. And again, not in New York, right? I feel like here is has the most authentic food, but then we have to go beyond just being authentic. You should be able to in incorporate, like you know, Will said, use local things. Um, you know, I have, there's this beef roll that I love to make. Um, it's made with, it's like this um, northern uh, cuisine. So it's like a beef roll with, and then you, you dip it with like um, a hoisin sauce and you have like julienne scallions in there. But what if I can incorporate, that's just like Asian five spice beef. But instead, maybe we can use Montreal, you know, steaks. Or use some like, somewhere from like, the, the uh, eastern part of Canada, but incorporate that into, like it's fusion, but fusion with a meaning, fusion with a purpose, not to fuse, just to fuse. So I would like to start making like food like that. Um, so Canadian cuisine. Um, <clears throat> so I had the opportunity to represent Canada at the World Cup in Luxembourg. So as we were sitting around a round table with my teammates, coaches, um, team managers, we went around the table. What is Canadian cuisine? We were all stumped. We were going to represent Canada on the world stage in a couple months, and we couldn't define what Canadian cuisine was. But, you know, all these chefs that said, you know, we have great product. We produce great seafood, we produce great proteins, we produce great vegetables, beef, grains. Um, and it's about using local, it's about highlighting what our backyard gives us. Um, so we are, Canada is a melting pot, um, but I think uh, as chefs, a lot of us are traditionally French trained. So kind of Canadian cuisine, I would say, would be um, kind of traditional French, you know, Montreal 
and then kind of putting our own spin on it with our own local ingredients. Um, and to answer your question of what dish I would give you to write put in your cookbook, um, at Wildlife we actually do a, a pescatarian a charcuterie board um, that I wanted to highlight BC. And we have uh, house-made salmon pastrami on there, local bee cured lingcod. Um, we have gandara sable fish. Uh, we I make it to a riette, and then uh, like marinated salt spring island mussels, and, uh, and and nori crackers, nori chips. And if that doesn't scream BC to you, I don't know what does. Um, and then also, I've got a I've got a gin steam mussel dish uh, with andouille sausage. Local ingredients, Salt Spring Island mussels, and then I also deglaze the pan with um, Sheringham gin, and especially their uh, seaside gin, because their seaside gin, uh, they use wing kelp in their distilling process right off the coast uh, in Tofino. So to me, that, that's Canadian cuisine. That's, that's kind of, you know, what I would, I would present uh, for your cookbook. For me, uh, it's my favorite Indian food is from the streets. And I keep recreating that street food called chaat. And chaat is like sweet, savory, salty, spicy. It hit, it's like Indian umami. And uh, you might have tried it in some of my pop-ups. And uh, every time I do the pop-up, my first uh, few courses are based off that uh, section. Because uh, it's just, you know, it's just punch in your face, pretty much, with the flavor. You know? And uh, with whatever is local in that season, I would add that in your cookbook with those flavors. Anything's possible. So ultimately, I think when we are cooking personally, when we're cooking for people, uh, it's also we're giving them something. We're giving them an idea. We're sharing an idea. We're sharing our passion with them. So if it doesn't actually mean something to the people we're cooking for, if it's not a story that's meaningful to them, then it's actually really hard for me personally to create a menu for anybody because I want to make sure that it fits a concept, it fits a reason, it fits a purpose, it fits a, some sort of significance. So. If you tell me what you want, then I can create something that's meaningful to you because that would then inherently become meaningful to me. Yeah, I feel like that one's a hard one to answer just because, like you said, anything is possible, right? Um, and it really depends on the client um, of what their expectations are and what they expect from me. Um, so I've been pretty blessed with some of the people I've cooked for where I don't even have menus for them anymore. And I just come in and they're like, six courses, sings in, we're on it. You know, so being able to do that, I feel like, you know, as soon as you ask the question, my brain kind of exploded with so many ideas, but it could be. And um, so, yeah, it is, it's endless. Um, but what I would do for, <laughs> if there was no budget, oh my God, I'd fly all my friends from around the world and we'd do like a 12 course dinner, you know, three hours and uh, yeah, if budget wasn't a thing. Um, and we would have a lot of fun, you know. At most of these events, when I go overseas, to like, like I'm going to be in Montreal and Toronto and for two weeks doing four pop-ups, and um, I do that on my own time. They, they sort my ticket. I'm like, I just want to collaborate with other chefs. I just want to work and learn. I'm still learning. I'm learning every day, um, and uh, I just miss being surrounded with fellow other chefs too. So for me to do these events outside of Vancouver who like think very similar to me or very similar to me. Um, yeah, but again, it's just, it's endless. It could, it could be really anything. Um, 
But yeah, I would fly all my friends <laughs> and do the sickest ball. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah, anyways, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would echo that. As soon as you asked the question, I was like, oh my goodness, like, there's so many things. Um, I, I always resort to, similar to what the other press have said, is just the intention behind it, the story behind it. I think anytime you're creating something, you know, new or trying to come up with a new concept, it, you always, I, I, I mean, for me personally, I always relate to, you know, how I started, I reflect back on the story. So immediately said that I thought about my grandma and the first ever thing that I cooked in the kitchen with her watching was chopped cookies, super basic, but how do I make that, you know, how do I do a spin on that that's like my own and kind of make it really, you know, interesting and unique and also, you know, honoring my Indian heritage too. So, um, I don't know, maybe something with Rasmalai and chocolate chips and I don't know, that just came to my head, so. I don't know, it's world girls here, yeah. I think instead of making money, I would love to go to a client's place, see what they have left over in their fridge and cupboard, and I'll make a five-star gourmet meal out of what you have. Because so much food is wasted, you know? Like every time I see my cook throw stuff, I go in there and literally the first thing I do, I don't say hi, I just start looking through trash can. And I will know what you throw away because I know your station very well, okay? And I'll pick it up and I'll put it on your cutting board and I want you to explain to me why this is in a garbage. Would you do this at home? No, because you pay for that shit, okay? You pay for every penny, every cent of that scallion. So why are you throwing away this much of the green when it's still usable? What I would do, if budget is not an issue, I will help you save your money because you can pay me, and I will then show you how you can cook all the stuff that could become waste. Because waste is money, you know? Waste, I tell my cooks, all the stuff that you throw into your garbage, that's actually your race right there. If you do this every single day, you're never gonna get a penny raise in the rest of your life, so you might as well look for another job. That's what I do. I would just cook what you have, and I'll show you how to make a good meal out of whatever you have, and then pay me. <laughs> Okay, awesome. I think I think that uh, kind of goes back to why we start cooking in the first place. Um, what fills my cup? Um, what I get satisfaction from? I think uh, to answer that, it's feeding people, feeding my friends, cooking for my friends and my loved ones. I think that's my love language. I, I love taking care of people. I love cooking for them. So if money or you know resources were an issue, like Mark said, I would invite all my chef friends to my restaurant, and we would just cook for all of my other friends who don't cook. And that would be an everyday, everyday, pretty bad business model, but uh, I think, but you said money was an issue, so I think, uh, I think, I think that would be, would be really fun and special. So. I'll, I'll take both of them together. <laughs> I'll collaborate with chefs from different culture. So I learn as well, because we have so many things when you share with different culture, you know, the dumplings from noodles to roti to like everyone, every culture has their own interpretation of, of it. And few courses I will add, uh, Chef Dejure is uh, use, the use the waste, <laughs> few courses on the spot, use the waste and uh, what's going bad in the fridge, just use that black box. Finding the right people to work with you, not for you, because you always want to be, it's a, it's a family, right? Because you're literally spending more time with these people now than you would with your, I don't know, your blow-up dolls or your, your girlfriends, <laughs> whatever it would be, right? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even drink. 
Um, so you're gonna spend more time with these people. So I think the hardest part is finding the right people that you can trust because you will spend more time micromanaging and make like doubting and worrying and then they will tie you down from what you could be doing which is um, overseeing things, um, making menu and all these stuff. So surround yourself with people that you trust that are competent. I know sometimes it's hard to find people with a brain cell but you know if you believe in it you will find them and then keep them, treat them well because if they don't show up to work, guess who's washing dishes? You are, you know? Guess who's gonna be uh, throwing garbage in the back alley with a rat the size of your face? You are. So you gotta make sure that you treat your people right, surround yourself with the right people, and everything else will fall into place. There's always the vendors, right? You, you only have this handful of vendors in Vancouver that you can call up and they will deliver to your door every day. Um, the, uh, you know, you only have like two, uh, Syntax and Canadian Linen that you can call for all these stuff. That you, those people you don't have to worry about because they're always gonna be there to help you. But who's gonna be there to back you up is your people and you need to find them, like now. And then firing them sucks, but you know what? Sometimes you just gotta do it too. Uh, congratulations, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in my opinion, I think the biggest thing is making sure that you have a cohesive concept and making sure that you're telling the story you really believe in telling and staying true to that story and then having the people who work with and for you see that vision and then want to perpetuate it, not because they have to, but because they want to. And um, that comes from obviously if, you, if you're the proprietor, like you start that culture and you create that culture and you're going to maintain that culture for them. That would be what I would say. I think for me, the biggest advice is uh, understanding your whys, right? Um, understanding your whys is important because that kind of gives you that sort of foundation whenever you feel lost, um, especially when you're having your team, your right hand person. Um, and if when you're building a management team or your core team, you have to remember also their growth plan. Without the growth plan, you can't move up either, right? It's important for you to be, if you're the CDC or you're the chef, that you have a replacement that you're training along the way because um, you're going to be stuck, um, then you can't evolve, you can't grow. So when you ingrain your whys within your core group, it's easier to sort of move on to the next step. Um, I do a little bit of that trial and error with my, event, my events now, um, ingraining our whys, why we, do it, why we do the event, you know. Even with them now, I, I make sure they're in a, in a room that they're comfortable making mistakes. Um, because that's who, that's how they're gonna grow. That's how they're gonna evolve. You give them that confidence to be able to uh, to execute at that level. And um, yeah, understanding your why is so important, and um, and making sure they have a growth plan and then your core team uh, would be my biggest advice for sure. Yeah, I would um, echo that too. Your why, your people, I think are probably your top kind of two, three things that you need to kind of handle. But I'll approach this in a more logistical way just because to provide the other side of the point. Um, your business plan matters and you spend some time actually sitting and thinking about that. What's what's the first month going to look like? Then what's your three months going to look like? Then six, like try to put it all on paper and dream while also trying to be realistic, like smart goals, taking it back to high school, right? Like something that's achievable, measurable, things like that, that is important to set milestones for yourself. And when you ingrain that with your why, with your people, it becomes, it becomes a, a full picture, right? It doesn't only focus on, you know, the more like high level stuff, like your why and your vision and your mission, but also the, the granular stuff that is so important. Your costing, your vendors, your plan A, B, C, D, E, what if, Vendor A runs out of sugar, which is what I'm going through right now. Damn. <laughs> so who's my plan B, C, D, E? Um, and how am I gonna put, put forth the, the systems in place, right? I'm a system girl, so definitely having a system in place for every little thing, um, I think is super important. Um, yeah, I think, I think all four of them so far have touched base on them. It's people, 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 people. Um, when it comes down to your vision or um, who you're working alongside with, whether it be your management team, bar manager, um, your sommelier, your AGM, sous chefs, you have to be so tightly knit together with your values and what you guys are striving towards for a common goal. Um, because 
if you know one kind of starts straying off oh i think i think doing volume and quantity is my main goal but then customer service or guest satisfaction starts sliding but you care about guest guest satisfaction then you're butting heads so i think really aligning your values with your core team and really um, giving your team the tools to succeed. Your sous chefs, your CDPs, your cooks, your dishwashers. By that, I mean supporting them in any way they, they need. Um, your team is only as, as strong as your weakest cook. So, so bring your team up as a whole. Um, really give them tools to succeed. And training manuals and, and structure. Structure is a big one where I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, you're going to be hiring stupid cooks. But if I gave each one of you a carrot and told you to peel it and dice it, I would have 50 different cuts. That's not to say you guys are stupid. Everybody has a different way of doing something. So really kind of just standardizing training and investing in that training. I know, I know training costs a lot of money, but investing in that training and it's going to save you in the long run than to rehire and retrain. So. I would say uh, enjoy the whole process. So when you enjoy working or buzzing or doing dishes, do like cooking or bartending, uh, it will be easy for you to work. You know? it, it's not going to be work because you're enjoying the whole process. And when it's successful, everyone enjoy it. But it's very also important when you fail, you enjoy that moment as well. It's, it's hard to enjoy that moment, but if you get through that, success will be you. And, uh, yeah. yeah, and also kind of touching, touching one, more, one more point that I want to bring up is, um, you know, obviously building a concept from the ground up is you're going to put your blood, sweat, and tears into this thing um, for a long time, for a long time. And to build this concept up and this project and your vision uh, sometimes it might be hard when it come time to trust somebody else in this project. Say your sous chef or right hand person. Um, because at the end of the day, you need to take care of yourself as well. You need time off. You can't work seven days a week, 16 hours a day. So to trust your right hand person on your two days off where you can relax and know that if something goes awry or you know a, a bag of sugar doesn't show up, that somebody else can figure it out for you or to know that your dish and everything's going to be executed at the same level, the same standard, whether you're running the line or not. And that's a, that's a big one. It's kind of like giving your baby up, right? And having someone watch it for the first time. Uh, next pop up though is uh, I'm gonna be at Bar Tartar. Uh, they just took over Birds and the Beats um, after Juice Bar. I'm there from the 12th to the 16th. And we're also doing on December 8th with Kitchen Infinity Appliance. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> we're, we're doing a cooking class and uh, we do like these cooking classes where we do a uh, two hour class and we send you canapes and you have drinks. It's a full experience at Kitchen Infinity Appliances. Uh, <laughs> uh, but for favorite eats, I love uh, snacky places. I, again, I eat alone a lot, so there's places that are really meant for that. Uh, any of the Goo franchise, from Goo Garlic, Goo, um, the Zakushi group, they do really well. They do skewers. Uh, again, um, anything in that context for me, because I don't want to just go into a nice place where I'm just going to have a salad, a starter, and, or a salad, main, and a dessert. I want to have like eight, ten things. Uh, I get like palate fatigue. I need like little snacks, but if I'm just having a big portion, I'm like I kind of get bored unless I start adding like vinegars and things to it. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Um, my favorite new restaurant is actually Wildlight. I've been a couple of times, and it's insanely amazing. So if you haven't logged out, um, I also love you know good Indian food. So I love tasty Indian bistro too. Um, they're really, really good. Yale Town. Um, yeah, and I, I would actually agree. I like snacking things. So um, Sing Sing is good. I like their stuff. Yeah. 
so good. Um, yeah, I love, we, me and my husband, we just go down like commercial and just walk into our places and just have something. So yeah, we're, we're always exploring. So yeah, explore. Dora. <laughs> I wouldn't say I have a favorite place to go, but what I, what I would say is growing up in this industry, uh, I, I took for granted my own culture's food. So like, uh, I would go for Chinese dinners every weekend, maybe two or three times a week with my family and my parents. Um, and then once I got into the industry, I lost all those weekends, right? I'm working every day that people don't want to work. And so I started missing my own culture's food even though I didn't know I valued it in the first place. So now, any chance I have, I'll have anything that has to be related to Cantonese food whatsoever. Yeah, but specific restaurant, I like McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, yeah, like, well, I don't think I have one place that I would go to over and over, but I would say, I would like to cook things that I normally, I would like to go eat things I normally don't cook at work. Um, so, Indian food, oh my god, I love, I love, I cannot wait to try yours. Um, I love Vietnamese food, you know, I don't really find a lot of good Thai restaurants here, maybe somebody can tell me where to go, I really love Thai food, but not really like much here in Vancouver. Um, yeah, so Chinese food, because my mom lives here with me, we share the same bed, that's why I'm single. Yeah, just, I mean, like, you want to come home with me? And my mom is like, nah. Um, but... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, but I always take my mom to dim sum. So there's actually a um, couple places that my mom and I usually go to. It's like Chef Tony, Chef Choice, and Sun Sui Wa. Like, those are the three places that we go to all the time. Um, and they're really good dim sum. Expensive, but good. Um, yeah, some of my top spots in the city. Um, recently just dined at Sushi Hill, uh, amazing restaurant, beautiful. Um, An and Chi is always super, super good, uh, right on Main Street there. Um, went to Como again recently, Como Taperia, also amazing. Um, just happens to be, all those restaurants happen to be on Main Street for some reason, I don't know. They have good restaurants. Um, yeah, or can, can be. Um, yeah, and, and, and like uh, Chef Chef Will said, he's uh, you know, growing up, we had dim sum with my grandpa every weekend, and I got so sick of it. I hated dim sum, but as you know, I got older, um, you have less and less time to do that, and that's kind of when I started craving it more. Where now, all my days off, I'll go for dim sum, you know, alone, and like, uh, and that's kind of what that's kind of what I I crave and. Um, we, you know, sometimes, you know, at, hang out at Two Shores House, having beer or whatever, we'll get, uh, we'll get, we'll get takeout, takeout kanji and chow mein and, uh, our favorite go-to spot is Guang Chow on, on Main Street! <laughs> it's on Main Street! It's on Main Street! Oh, sorry, I stole, I stole his answer. Yeah, so, my favorite is Guang Chow, and their kanji is the best, like, for me, is the best ever. I have, and I kanji is one of my favorite comfort food. In oh, any Chinese restaurant I order, I always <laughs> go for uh, kanji. In Indian, I really like dosa and curry. It's on uh, Fraser in Southwest Marine Drive. And uh, there's this uh, Fraser, dosa corner, dosa corner. Sorry, yes, Fraser and Southwest Marine Drive. And uh, there's this. Uh, Another Indian restaurant is vegetarian uh, called Apnabaya, and it's on Main Street in the middle of nowhere, but it's, it's so homely. Uh, Main and 51st? Yeah, what's it called? Yeah, Apnabhaya. Apna, A P N A B H A Y A. Is it free? I think it's Main. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's a sweet shop, but uh, yeah, it's a sweet. But they also do savory, and they, I think it's uh, it's it's the best. It's it's so good, and uh, mostly uh, like you will only see Indian uncle and aunties there most of the time, so, and I think that's uh, one of my favorite. Anand Chi always 
my, one of my favorite. And one of my friends just opened up a restaurant on Granville and 12th Gary's. And uh, that's my new favorite restaurant. There's a hole in the wall on uh, Victoria Drive by Nanaimo. No, are they parallel? Anyway, um, it's called Cafe Zue, uh, Zue, X U E. So they have a really good uh, Vietnamese bumble way. So it's like a spicy pork hot, um, pork hot um, Vietnamese soup. Uh, it's literally like when I first moved to Vancouver, I had that, and now I'm like, okay, I'm staying in Vancouver. It, this is that's so good. Cafe X U E. Yeah, so good. Kingsway, oh, Kingsway in Victoria, Nanaimo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to have Thai for you. So, the Thai restaurant, my favorite Thai is Bad Chalky Thai in Langley. Chef Brandy over here owns it. She had, was a speaker for us from five years ago. Okay, okay. Less than five. Will you pay for my gas? Do we have a passport? No. <laughs> Just kidding. So I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. The speakers were amazing. Big round of applause for them, please. <laughs> I also want to thank Lawrence for taking care of registration and Phil for filming tonight. And uh, Jeff, who's not here, is editing the films afterwards. And you'll say thank you again for coming. Oh yes, and thank you Tolache again for feeding us tonight and for the drink.